Awesome, so I guess we'll get started then. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Ben Grant, I'm the MSYP for Perthshire North, and I'm also the convener of the Education and Lifelong Learning Committee within the Scottish Youth Parliament. And obviously, as you can guess, my remit is education, so um, yeah, should we just... Hi everyone, my name is Zainab Adele, I am the MSYP for Glasgow Southside, and I'm the deputy convener for the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, and equalities as well. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Bruce, I'm the Children and Young People's Commissioner of Scotland. I always describe it as the best job in the world because it's my job to promote and safeguard the rights of the over a million children and young people all across Scotland. Uh, when I first got the job, I travelled around the country and, and asked children what they wanted from me and they told me all sorts of um, amazing things. But one of them, uh, one of the things that I love is up in Shetland, they told me they wanted me to be savage in holding those in power to account. I think it's the kind of Viking heritage up there. So, so, so that's kind of fed into my strategic planning and it's jobs very much around accountability. And so I think that the, the focus of this panel is, is really dear to my heart in terms of looking at the purpose of education and the failures of, of government at all levels to, to ensure that we're actually taking a rights-based approach. Um, has been evidenced so well in, in this film and in this project and this discussion. So looking forward to the discussion. Um, I'm Laura Lundy, most of you know me. I'm a professor of children's rights at Queen's Belfast and in Cork. But what I was just saying to Ian here is that what you probably don't know about me is that um, I qualified as a barrister and I ran a law clinic and I got into children's rights via education law. I wrote, I just explained to you, in the toilets, so that I started, that, that was my route, was domestic education law. I wrote the first textbook in it in Northern Ireland, and it is Byzantine. It is so, education law is so complex, and it's hard enough for lawyers, but it's impossible for parents. And I think school exclusion, suspension, or one, one of um, Special, what we call it special education needs, or you call it additional needs. It is so complex, so it's great we have people like uh, hi, my name is Ian Nisbet. I, I am an education law solicitor and um, I work mostly with uh, families with children who have either disabilities or uh, additional support needs. Um, I also am part of a national um, project called My Rights, My Say, um, which provides direct support and representation to children with additional support needs aged 12 to 15. Uh, in terms of exercising and enforcing their rights under that legislation. Uh, and some of the time, more often than is healthy, I think, uh, that casework uh, involves children who have been excluded from school, either formally or informally. Fabulous. Right. Well, Laura said to me that one of the things she really wanted out this afternoon is a bit more engagement from the floor. So there's your challenge. If there are things that um, the panel are talking about that you're really interested in or that you've got really good examples. And I think what, what today has shown us is that there's a real power in those kind of like really practical examples. Please put your hand up. I'll, I'll kind of like keep an eye more on this side of the room than this side of the room. And like if you want if you want to talk, just shout. OK, so first question. Okay, so children report being informally excluded or being taken off the school roll. There are no statistics for this in education. To what extent do you feel children are excluded using these methods, particularly those nearing 16 or over, and what impacts does this sort of inclusion have? Uh, yeah, so um, it happens quite a lot, I think, is my impression. Um, and uh, as you say, it's not then recorded in statistics. Sometimes the education authority at head office don't even know that this has happened. It's just sort of taking place at a school level. Um, and um, so the exclusion statistics that come out then are, are really um, can be misleading, I think, under reporting um, what the guidance says very clearly um, should be counted as exclusions. Uh, I think recently there, there was a... Um, report on the exclusion statistics said only one child in the whole of Scotland was permanently excluded from a school in the, in the whole of that particular reporting year, which was just nonsense. Uh, and what education authorities have done is they've kind of taken a leaf from the independent schools playbook where they just sort of have a quiet word with people and, and, and expect them to leave of their own accord. Um, and, and that's what you see. And you get all sorts of euphemisms um, that, that people use. It's dealing with a, a child aged 15 uh, in uh, foster placement, and she was uh, told to leave school and to not come back to her school. And we 
challenged that and we said to the local authority that that was an exclusion and they disagreed even all the way up to the tribunal and they were insisting that it wasn't an exclusion even though very clearly they were saying that she couldn't come back to school and that if she tried to that they might call the police uh, and uh, they described it as having relocated her educational opportunities off campus uh, <laughs> which um, it is almost uh, Orwellian in its, um, it, you know, attempts there, and I, th and I think it's, it's a really big problem. I think the, the, the point made in the question as well about those who are approaching the age of 16 can often be given a really big uh, hint uh, that uh, their educational opportunities lie elsewhere, uh, and often young people, uh, parents don't know that they can insist on staying at school, and, and uh, that's something that comes up uh, May, June time every year, uh, we'll get inquiries about that sort of thing. And I think a lot of head teachers genuinely believe that once you hit the age of 16, that you can just be shown the door, which is not the case. Yeah, um, this is quite quite a big issue in the research project I mentioned that we're doing with in the Four Nations, and it's everywhere. And um, from a rights perspective, it really um, you know frustrates and angers me because once you once you do that, the child's just given the impression you've lost all access to legal entitlement unless you know you can get to Ian. You know, if you're dismissed, there's an appeal process, there's accountability. If you're just told not to come back or given, you don't you lose all those rights that go with the formal process. But I've been kind of coming up with this term of um, like constructive exclusion. There's a thing called constructive dismissal, and that's not when you're sacked. It's when the situation is so bad you walk out, you know? Um, and there's a constructive exclusion. I think quite often what's happening is school is made so intolerable for some young people that they don't turn up, you know? And that's so the school isn't even doing the off-rolling thing. It's just making it. And then there's some, well, they didn't come back. We can't make them. And they don't care at this age because the, attend the education welfare service isn't going to push for attendance. So there's kind of all sorts of practices that are really gray and deny young people their normal procedural rights to challenge you. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting issue, isn't it? Because it's like, how do you challenge something that technically, you know, according to the government, isn't there? Um, I suppose it comes back to what we were talking about earlier about accountability. How do we account for the fact that the kids are effectively just going missing, you know? Um, how do you challenge those behaviours? It becomes a really difficult topic. I think, obviously, if you're excluding from someone from school, informally or formally, you are taking them out of education. Where do they go after that? I mean, yes, you might argue some might go into apprenticeships, some might go into, you know, other employment, but what happens to the large number of people who just completely drop off the radar and end up with very little to nothing? And it's like, what do you do in that situation? Um, it's, been, it's been really well covered. Um, we're supposed to be doing a bit of audience participation, so I'm going to jump in with, with some of that. And so, ask you all in the audience, um, so the... The methodology we'll use is, for those of you that are able to stand, if you can stand up, and the question is, how big an issue do you think this is in your local authority area? And if you think it's a huge, huge issue, um, put your hand up, like stretch up as tall as you can get. And if you think it's not really an issue, um, right down to the floor. So if everyone stand up, in so far as you're able to. Um, and then given, as, as Ian said, the, the national statistics say this isn't a problem, because we don't have statistics, but in your local authority area, how big an issue do you think that it is? So we're getting lots of hands up to the sky. Is anyone a bit lower? So, yep, so there's, there's okay, we're up there. So, go, go, go. Okay, um, you, can, you, can, you can pick either or both, so. So one of them's amazing and one of them's awful. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I genuinely, I've, um, I, I, I live in East Rennes and I don't think there's a big off-road. I, 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 I believe it happens, but not massively. I think in Glasgow, I formerly worked in youth justice and I, and I actually had a wee bit of a question for Laura, but I don't want to derail us if you want to come back after we'll, you've done your thing. We'll come, we'll come back to you yeah. with the question. Um, and so there's some big hands reaching to the sky up here. So which, which where, where are you from, if you're happy saying that? And, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Pick it up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so basically, in my community that I work in, there's a population of about 800 people, and we already have identified six individuals that are not in education. Yeah, yeah. so, so that, 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 that's huge percentage-wise, isn't it? Um, anyone else who is really high or really low that wants to... Yeah. Sorry, I've taken over the chairing. <laughs> 
Um, so I work in Edinburgh, and we have um, we work on projects with young people who are not attending school. We, we ran a project for the Gypsy Traveller community where they're not formally excluded, but school becomes impossible for them. They leave at 12, 13, and there's very little provision, very little help for them. There's very little literacy support for them. So there's nothing for them to do, really. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Okay, you can sit down. I'm going to make you do that again, so just, 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 just that you're aware and we'll get some exercise. Um, just in, t in terms of my reflections on it, I think the, the point on the data is really important, the point that Ian made, made earlier. Um, we need to make sure that, that this is properly recorded in order to, to ensure we know what's happening and we don't at the moment. That's actually a recommendation we've, we've put forward to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child as part of the, the review of, of Scotland and the UK to make sure there's a really clear recommendation that we've got clear data. But the, the second part of the question I think is really interesting in terms of what's the impact of, um, of being excluded even on, on, a, on a temporary basis. And, and from, from a rights perspective, that this is really important because not only is there a right to education, but the Convention on the Rights of the Child sets out the purpose of education. And it's this holistic idea of developing children to their fullest potential. It's not just about passing exams, but it's about developing all of, all of you so that you can, you can be um, fully engaging in your community, understanding who you are, and understanding the natural environment. Um, so, so much of education isn't just about passing exams, it's about developing you to your, your fullest potential. And so when you're excluded from the state obligation to do that, that's really problematic. And actually, and, and, and again, as Ian mentioned, we've got a domestic legal framework that says you're entitled to this and a right to it. And again, even post-16, there's really clear commitment to ensure that you show what the kind of educational pathway is for those that aren't in the formal schooling system. And so that state failure, going back to the discussion that we had in, in the previous panel, it's really important that we see this as a rights issue and a failure of the state to deliver on that promise to children and young people of having that, that right to education and being able to fulfil that in the way that, that best suits the, 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 the child's needs and the involvement of that child and, and helping to design that's absolutely essential. And the impact of it, of that failure of the state, flows really strongly through into physical and mental health, into the way in which, which you engage with, with society, kind of socialisation, um, association, all of those other things, um, right, to, to, to recreation, rest and play, is all, all linked in if you're excluded from the, the formal systems and there's not other systems put in place to support you, that has a catastrophic effect on children and young people at the time, but also can, can be lifelong. And so I think, I think that second part of it is really important in terms of the impact is absolutely profound, and we need to see this as a failure of the state to deliver on a really clear obligation in rights terms and within domestic, um, domestic law as well. Um, sorry. <clears throat> uh, um, in regards to the first part of the question and you know how often it happens, I think it happens a lot of times, especially in regards to things like league tables, how many A's does our school get, you know, so it's gotten to the point where schools don't care about the pupils anymore, they just care about, you know, getting that high rate in, so it happens a lot, so it gets to the point where you're like 16 and then you're already starting to be told like, oh, I don't think you would do hires, leave, you become a hairdresser or go into apprenticeships, you know, et cetera. And how this affects, you know, us is, we start to feel like bud burdens, you know what I mean? It's like, and I feel like they don't realize it has like this domino effect. If, for example, my friend was told, I feel like you're really, oh, okay, yeah, okay. I think you're really dumb. I think you should become a, um, a hairdresser. I was start to get apathetic. The microphone hates me, don't worry. Um, I was starting to get rather apathetic because my friend has been told this. You get what I mean? My attitude would change. So she's left school now because of what the school has told her. I start to change and then I'm told to leave school and then my other friends start to change and they're told to leave school. Now this school doesn't exist anymore. All we care about is the league tables. All we care about is our A's and everything. And aside from the technicality, it's like, where's the humanity? It's like the schools need to be reformed, like entirety. You need training all over again. Because if we as young people are put in your care, you're my teacher, you're my head teacher, I'm put in your care because they believe you're responsible enough, you know, to be socially aware 
about the things you say, about what, how you behave towards me. If you lack that, you should be removed. You, sh you need training all over again. So they need to realize the domino effect. They need to realize that humanity plays a very, very important aspect in this. And that's it. Yeah, I totally agree, Zainab. I mean, something I've just been thinking about there, it's like, what kind of a tone does this set? It's like, if you're being kicked out of school, it's like, usually the people who are in formal school are people who aren't, you know, doing very well academically. They have, you know, whatever issues in their own lives that are, you know, they're struggling to resolve and could ideally do with some support with. These are the people that the school is basically saying, we don't want to deal with you, it's your issue now, off you go. So again, why, why are we accepting this culture as it is? It's, it's completely toxic. And as Zainab says about the league tables, it's like, I mean, this, this whole thing is driven about school's reputation and league tables and performance. And it's like, we're all hooked on this idea of successful learners and the curriculum for excellence and getting your hires and advanced hires and so on. But what about social skills and the meta skills? What about the things, you know, for example, I, I do some part-time work uh, with children who uh, have additional support needs, autism, and so on. And for some of them, being able to maintain eye contact is a massive, massive achievement. They might never get an advanced hire in physics or modern studies or whatever, but for them, that is a huge achievement. And by kicking people who may be struggling in a mainstream education system out of school, you're effectively saying, you're not good enough. We don't want you in this society. You, off you go. It's your problem. And I, I find that just totally disgusting. And I'm sure most of you here, if not all of you here, will agree with that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's totally wrong. And obviously we're talking about informal exclusions and being excluded from the actual building and education. But I think it's also important to acknowledge the situation within schools, people who are still in school, being told, oh no, you can't do that higher because you've not met certain, you know, grades or, you know, you can't do this and you can't do that higher. And it's like, who are you to say that I can't achieve this out of the next thing? And it's like, you know, just because you didn't do Nat 5 doesn't mean you can't do a higher. You know, there might have been some situation in your home life or in other, you know, parts of your own existence that have, have impacted your ability to perform at a Nat 5 level. I mean, this, again, goes to testify as to why our own exam system doesn't work, if nothing else. But it's like, you know... Just because you've not got a certain grade, it doesn't mean you can't go on to be really successful. So it's time we stop judging people based on academic grades and school performance, but rather on their you know, ability to function in society and their ability to empathize with others, their ability to communicate. I mean, these are such important skills that I feel that we just totally neglect in mainstream education at the moment. Um, so yeah, I thought, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you go. It, it, I, think, I think this is a real, sorry, we're diverting a wee bit from the questions, but I think this is, a, this is a really important point in terms of coming back to the purpose of education. And, and I think it's interesting when you talk to kind of business and, and community in terms of what they want in terms of being able to be really productive in, in terms of building society. It's about problem solving, it's about team working, it's about all of the soft skills that we don't measure very well within the education system, we don't, we don't value. Who, who are the, the children in, in our school communities who are the kind of peacemakers and problem solvers and who are, the, who are the ones that are really caring? Because those are actually the skills we really need in society. And the, the purpose of education set out in, in Article 29 actually speaks to that. It's about developing the skills to allow you to, to work in, 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 in a society. And, and I think that the education system doesn't actually focus and value on those things. And in Scotland at the moment, we've got a review of education. And I think, again, I, without dividing us too much, I think that would be an interesting uh, point to discuss, because I, I know the, the pair of you have got a lot to say on this, but um, we've got an opportunity at the moment where the purpose of education is being, and structures of education is being reviewed, but I'm not really sure how many young people, and particularly those who aren't having positive experiences with education, are involved in that. Um, so without diverting too much from the questions, I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about, about that. Um, well, I just wanted to say it was regarding um, examples, right? You know, Ben was talking about, like, what makes you think you can tell me I can't do this and that. I currently study law in the University of Dundee, and I met this guy. And I was, like, going back to Glasgow because I, I live in Glasgow. And I was like, oh, you live in Glasgow as well? And, I'm like, and he's like, yeah. His school was literally like five minutes away from my house. I'm like, wow, what a small world. And he was like, yeah, do you know I actually got excluded from school? 
I'm like, you're here studying law. And he was like, yeah, because I went home, studied on my own, went into the exams and aced it. And he was like, I intentionally went back to my school, told my teacher, yeah, I'm going to Dundee now to do law. And they were all irritated and they were all angry. And I was like, if he can do it on his own, the education system has failed. If he can just say, you guys are telling me I can't do this, I can't do that, and I can go on my own and do this and get into law, the education system has failed. And I was like, I'm really proud of you for not letting them you know, drown your, you know, your ambition. You know, so I was just like, no one is dumb. No one is dumb. Anyone can become anything they want to become. And he is a solid example of that. Yeah, again, I've, I've known people similar to that. Zain, have you know, I think we've all got examples of that in our own lives. Um, obviously, Bruce, you're answering there about the national discussion and, you know, how young people are getting involved in reform in general. Um, I think the government is trying to involve young people. I mean, certainly, like, Zainab and I, obviously, independent of government in this, but we're on the exam reform with Louise Hayward. Um, obviously, myself and Sophie, we go to the Scottish Education Council meetings. Um, so we are moving in, a, in the right direction. I think, you know, things are progressing. But in terms of our wider participation of young people within reform, within politics, within our society, I think we're still really lacking in that area. And there's a lot more we could be doing to include young people, not just MSYPs, but, you know, those seldom heard voices, people who are marginalised, people who are told, you can't do this. Um, and, yeah, I think, obviously... There's no one size fits all. We can't just put out a survey and that'll suit everybody. We can't just do fo focus groups and that'll suit everybody. I think we need to try and use every medium possible to try and get across how important this actually is. And we, we really want to try and bring in all these views from every diverse group and you know setting in our society. And that is some monumental task, I have to admit, but it's, it's a task worthwhile. Um, and like I say, and I, actually, as, as I mentioned to you earlier, I think. We're at such an important juncture in Scottish education whereby COVID has exacerbated so many issues that already existed in our education system and so many more people have become aware of these issues. Um, and I think now that we have this opportunity where people are, they have their eyes open, I think we now is the time to get this right and really drive forward that change, really push out the fact that you know we're having this national discussion, we're doing this exam reform, what do you think? And really try and get the country involved, which I don't feel like we're quite getting at the moment. Um, and obviously there's, there's fatigue, I think, at the moment. People, people really think that if we don't fix this now, if we don't get these reforms through now, if we don't get the voices heard now, I think we're gonna be really struggling in the future to continue this work. It is a bit of a once in a lifetime opportunity here. People are getting fed up of reforms that actually are just a rebranding of the same old, same old. And what we really need to do is make sure via whatever means necessary that we are bringing these voices into the fold and we are making the reforms that are needed, whether people like it or not. You know, we have to be blunt about it. We have to say, this is not good enough. This needs to change. And the status quo just isn't good enough. Does that answer your, yeah, sorry. I just want to say, I mean, the reason we're all here today is, is this film, Excluded, you know, and it does it really powerfully. You know, it captures the young people who don't get heard, shows their experience, shows how they ended up excluded, what they were feeling, what they were experiencing. And you can't watch it. If you haven't already seen it, you're going to be blown away by it. You know, and it's really, it's, we, there are ways of doing this, and this is brilliant. This is a brilliant example of it. Can I do a slightly different theme? Because I think it is... I think you're absolutely right about value and you know, which skills do we value. But one of the things that I've been working on lately, in, and I'm really curious in the room, is whether this happens in Scotland. From a rights perspective, is this idea about you know, when children are disruptive and they get put out for mild disruption, you know, whatever, behavioural issues over time, and they're put out in different ways, maybe the frozen out thing. And it's this, the rights of the other 29 issue. You know, and it's such a fault. I mean, it's an, a really false version of human rights law that, that this child is interfering with, with the rights of the other 29 to an effective education. And I've written about this, and I feel really passionate about it. So just remember, I want to. I've got an audience to say something. It's wrong because often what is happening is they say it's the right of this child versus the right of the other 29, the right of this child of education to the right of the other 29. But actually, what's happening with this individual child who's disruptive? 
probably, is a breach of their rights. Something has gone wrong when they are not being delivered the conditions where they can have it in meaningful, usually inclusive, because usually there's additional support needs involved that, that are not being met, that are creating these conditions. So I, I could talk all day, and I'm not going to, but you work on these issues. So I'm passing to you. What was the question? The question is about, <laughs> do you find that schools are telling them that, that they're too destructive, you're ruining the, you're ruining the education of the others? Yeah, uh, yeah so, so I mean, that is, that is occasionally an issue, and, and obviously the, the, yeah. the ground for exclusion is phrased in those terms. So uh, it's, you know, the continued attendance of the child would be uh, seriously disruptive to order and discipline. Uh, or the educational well-being of the other pupils. So the, the, the way the law is set up is, is specifically couched in those terms. Uh, and so I guess that encourages that kind of thinking. Um, the, the most recent example of, of uh, that in, in terms of a case and an authority formally pleading that um, was actually in terms of a restraint uh, case. And, and, and they were saying, well, you know, the, the rights of the other children in the class compelled us to assault this pupil. Um, for, for want of a better phrase, and, and, and that that was seen as, as much sort of um, justification as was needed, rather than, as you say, looking, looking back to, well, how did we get to that situation? Where are the safeguards that are in place? Where are the support mechanisms and so on? That's a bigger, a bigger conversation. We've got, we've got somebody here who's going to say something, unless Bruce wants to leap in or... I was going to come on restraint and seclusion, but if you've got a point on the same point... Then it's kind of on the same point, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Julie, and my colleague Janine down here, we both work for Education Scotland, and part of our role is around children's rights and delivering professional learning to teachers and educators and practitioners in different settings around um, articles and kind of how to embed them. Um, and quite often, I'd say... Um, I have questions come in from teachers about putting children outside of the classroom. And it's that exact thing that you're saying. The teachers are saying, but we have these other kids. And um, if I had a pound every time, I'd be really rich. Um, and I just think this is my opportunity to ask the real experts. I know how I kind of describe my reply in the training sessions, but this is my opportunity to ask you how... Um, how to frame that kind of answer, because we know it's not right, but we still get the questions very, very often. And I just think that it's, um, it's really powerful um, for me to be able to kind of give your response back when those questions do inevitably come up. Um, I think that that's a, that's a really important point in terms of those that are working with and for children and young people um, in education settings. Um, the blame shouldn't sit with, with them, I suppose. It's, we, we, need to, we need to avoid getting into the situation where saying the fault is to do with, with teachers rather than saying there's a, a systemic failure here. That If you don't have the, the resources and support and guidance in order to, to ensure that all children's rights are fulfilled, um, then that's a problem. That, that's up the chain, and, and, I, and I'm, we've always been really clear in the work that we've done that this isn't about, about blaming kind of individual teachers or, or teaching assistants or others. This is about saying there's been a, a problem here in terms of resourcing, support, and guidance. And so my office, the first um, legal investigation we did was into restraint and seclusion to pick up on exactly this point where children are communicating their distress and the, 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 the teachers and support staff around them don't have the, the, the resources, skills, and training to properly address that. And so they take an action which breaches children's rights by restraining or secluding them, um, and, and which in, in many cases is a, a criminal matter in terms of assault, but also it's a denial of, of, of their rights in terms of education, in terms of, of socialization, and, and, and also their, their personal autonomy. And so there's, there's huge problems here, but the, the response to it is to focus on the state obligation, in this case the Scottish Government's obligation to set in place really clear guidelines, um, to make sure that there's proper training and support in place, um, and to put that on a statutory basis, and for local authorities to make sure that there's, there's, there's proper support in place. And so I suppose that the question that I would, would put back to, to those teachers is saying, well, why did you feel that that was the last resort? So you should only be doing that um, on a proportionate basis. So you're denying a child their right to education, and again, without moving into restraint or seclusion, but you're, you're denying a child a right to, to education. You could, should only do that 
um, if it's the last resort, you've tried everything else and it should be for the minimum time possible and it's proportionate. And so what stopped you doing all of the other things that you want to do? No one wants to put a child outside. That, child, that child's communicating their, their distress. Um, no child wants to be excluded either. So there's a lot going on there. What's stopping you from, from taking a more rights-based approach to be able to, to support that child, to communicate with them, to understand what's going on? And if the problem is resourcing, that you're one teacher and you've got 30 kids, 30 kids plus, um, and there's a lot of distress being communicated across your class, um, a, a rights-based approach is going to go back and say, right, there's a resourcing issue here, we need more support in place so that we've got the time to build those trusted relationships with, with children to understand what's going on. And I think that the incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is coming very soon in Scotland, is going to be really key to that because actually a lot of the time this is about budget, it's about making sure that there's finance in place to ensure that staffing levels are high enough, that training and support are there. Because no teacher or, or, or teaching assistant wants to be in a situation where you've got a child who's incredibly distressed and your only option is, or the only option as you see it, is, is, to, is to exclude them. So we need to really rethink that and human rights um, and the incorporation of the CRC is a really useful tool to talk about kind of the use of available resources and, and human rights based budgeting to make sure that we've got resources in into to schools and education settings to make sure that support's there. So I, I suppose, sorry that was really long winded, um, but I, I suppose it would be going back to ask that question. It's like how do we end up in the situation where we thought that the only available recourse was, was to exclude a child. And so the, the, the problem started a long way before that. The, the problem started in terms of the failure to properly support that child to engage with, engage with education. Sorry, that was... Yeah, fine. Thank you for that. Um, obviously, again, we've all got our own experiences from school. I think you rightly say it's a resourcing issue. There are, you know, schools are horrifically underfunded and the funding varies between local authorities and school districts and so on. Um, I was one of those disrupt disruptive kids. I, I was excluded from school. Um, and, you know, I'm not being funny. The, the problem typically starts when the school fails to recognise that there's an issue. And it's not necessarily an academic issue or a sport for learning issue. Sometimes it's a social issue or there's something going on in your own life that, you know, all, <laughs> a whole plethora of different potential problems that could arise. But the problems start is when the, the school doesn't recognise that there's an issue and it festers and it goes on and on and on and on and you're continually shut down and told behave, shut up, be quiet, do your work and it's like again and again you're not addressing the actual issue and then sometimes these flare ups in class where kids get disruptive they can be stopped before they even happen and all it would take is a five minute sit down with the kid, what's going on, how's your day going, you know, how can we help? And then sometimes you might get a scenario where they start bawling their eyes out, crying, and you know, the whole story comes to light, and the school can deal with it. And it doesn't have to be a massive issue. But when schools don't recognise there's a problem and then fail to acknowledge the problem when it does arise, and then does things like internal exclusions, informal exclusions, detentions, and so on, they're just repressing the kids. Um, and in, in an ideal world, there would be the funding, there would be the resources to reduce class sizes to say, you know, 15 per teacher at most, um, where, you know, students could have a better relationship with their teachers, more one-on-one, -on -one, and it's, it's, it is a bit of a difficult situation we're in. And obviously you mentioned teacher training as well. Teachers get a lot of training, as it is, um, but is it the right training? And is it getting across properly? Because you can say, yeah, we need to give teachers more training on additional support needs, we need to give them more training on socio-economic issues that have arised in the local community and so on and so forth, but are we really getting the message across? Because you can send someone to a one-hour seminar, but is anything going in? I don't know, maybe. Um, so, you know, I think we have to look long and hard and not only the way we're treating kids who are disruptive, but the way the schools are handling situations before they arise, after they arise, because you, you don't need resources as such to, to recognise an issue. You don't need resources to have a five-minute chat with a kid to say, are you okay? You know, that is just intuition and a bit of experience and a bit of skill. And, you know, we have to have a long, a long hard look at how schools are dealing with situations and how we're actually training teachers in the first place. I think that's probably a good place to leave that. <laughs> I'm not going to, that's been a long answer and there's so many questions, but I, 
what I, I've written with Jenna Gillett Swan, who's an academic in Australia and a teacher, a framework for working your way through the rights. And I, I'm not going to do the lecture. I'm, I can share it with you. And it is a bit of what you know, we've been talking about. It's working through what are the actual rights at stake. Um, but the bit I want to mention is our second element is um, compromise. You know, because it's the flexibility to compromise and not make, you know, that, you know, the child sit or go through it. Definitely listening. I really totally agree with you, Ben. That's the first thing. But after that, what can you actually do to manage? And I've seen this incredible system. I examined a PhD. The women's actually just taken over a school for children with um, additional needs in London, uh, in Dublin, I noticed on social media. And she'll be amazing. And she devised a system in a school for children who just were not, you know, were really get demonstrating disruptive behaviour. And it was almost a bit like, um, who wants to be a millionaire? kind of like phone a friend, get out. You could use these passes to just let the steam off. It wasn't going and putting them in an exclusion room and sitting in between walls and getting more bored. It was just ways devised with young people where they could leave they could leave and do something else and come back, you know? And schools aren't really set up for that, but they should be. And you can set those systems up with young people if you choose to. This woman, Paula Flynn, devised that and it was a really excellent system. This is what happens when you say that you want more engagement. You start getting lots of people leaping in. Oh, I see you've got, uh, you know. Oh, so we've there. got yeah. two people here. Um, my name is Kerry Watson, and I'm the manager of a project called Keeping Families Together, which works with young people in secure care across Scotland. So we work across the whole five secure care centres. And I would say that the impact, relating back to the question, is that young people start to come in contact with the justice system if they're not in school. Um, if things like neural diversity is not picked up at that early age, um, we exclude children. And so when you talk about disruptive, I would say distressed, not disruptive. Yeah. And it's about people recognising the difference between a distressed child and a disruptive. And the impact is, is terrible. Because then it goes back to what um, Betty was talking about and the trajectory that they're on is they're going for being excluded to the prison. And, and that's real, and it's, it's, it's here. And it's now, and at any time in Scotland, we've got 84 children in secure care. Now, they've all been excluded for education. They're going to another system of education that their educational background doesn't follow them into secure, so we've got a problem there. Um, and then they come back to community without proper care plans. And if you had a proper care plan, we would know that this child is displaying... Um, um, issues that we would think are probably neurodiverse, so therefore mainstream education is not going to do them. And we send them back in, and again, they become disruptive or they recognise their behaviour as disruptive, as distressed. Mm -hmm. So I think if we could recognise that at a very early age, then we could stop those young people going into secure care in the very first place, and hopefully they could reach brilliant potential. Because having a neurodiverse condition doesn't mean you can't flourish. Lewis Capaldi is a perfect example of that. Um, so I think we just should recognise that as distressed behaviour. You want to go first? Yeah, those, those are some fantastic points you've raised, and you know you're totally right. And again, it comes back to you know Betty and the work you've been doing around you know the exclusion to prison pipeline, and it totally is that. Um, I think the interesting thing I was just thinking there. I remember having a conversation a few months ago, and it was about. Um, the socialisation effect on young people from being excluded. And it's like by being shut down, sent out of classes, shouted at by teachers, ignored, what you're actually doing is you're not dealing with that situation. You're actually socialising them to think that their behaviour and their feelings aren't valid. And that in itself is even more damaging than potentially even the exclusion itself. Because that, that, that mentality stays with them forever. You know, you, the primary and secondary socialisations you receive from your parents, your early years, nursery, primary, secondary, that is the biggest impact ever on a person's life, you know. And to get that wrong is horrifically bad. You know, it's like if, you, if you mess that up, then you may as well sign off the prison papers already because, you know, it's like you're condemning them to a life where they don't feel valued and they don't feel represented, they don't feel understood, and they spend their life feeling frustrated and angry and upset at the system and a situation that could have been completely avoided in the first place if the resources and the system was built to recognise these issues and deal with them in the first place. 
Um, yeah, sorry, it was another question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it was just a point, really. It was really for Education Scotland. I'm Amanda Corrigan, and I'm from the University of Strathclyde, where we have um, lots of people who come to learn to be teachers or teachers who come back for more education. And I'm actually working with teachers tomorrow to talk about... Um, exclusion. So let me just stand in the gap for the teachers and say from their perspective when they say I have been hit, I have been spat on, I have been punched, somebody threw a chair, we've got seven bells in the school that ring so that we all stay in our classroom with the door locked because there's a child now in the corridor and we can't let other children out there. And I think perspectives, Education Scotland is the thing that I would say that's what I'm doing with the teachers tomorrow, um, getting them to think about situations from the perspective of the child from their own perspective and their own perspective being valid, that it's all right to say sometimes I'm scared of these children. Yes. I don't want to be bit at my work. I don't want somebody to throw a chair at me when I'm, I'm at my work. And all of that being valid. But also for everyone to understand that there's one pie. And the school gets one pie. And if we take the five minutes off to, to have a chat with that child, then it's a five minutes that we've lost from something else. Or we take a classroom assistant, we put them in that place, then that classroom assistant, we've used the money in a classroom assistant that we don't have for something else. So what we all know in the room is the resourcing isn't there. And we can talk about the different people's perspectives and complain from their perspective. But that doesn't move anybody on. We all have conversations complaining from the perspective of the person who's most upset about the thing. How can we start to move people on? How can we start to think about things that we could do or change your mindset. And one of the things that I do with teachers is explain some of the things that you're talking about today. Let me tell you what can happen when a child is excluded from school. And lots of teachers will say, I didn't really realise that. I knew that they were out of the class and now I can teach and I've got peace, but I didn't realise that once they were in that pupil referral unit or the extended outreach, whatever it's called, that they would never get back into mainstream. So trying to get them to understand, because I'll, one final thing, for everybody here, teachers are often the person that gets to open the can of Coca-Cola. So the can of Coca-Cola is a child and the child goes home and then there's no dinner. So the can of Coca-Cola gets shaken and then there's fighting in the house at night and the child gets hit and mum and dad are fighting. The can's getting shaken, the can's getting shaken. They're late getting up in the morning because they haven't been able to sleep because there's so much chaos in the house and the can gets shaken. No breakfast, go into school and they're in a bad mood and the teacher says, come on. Now, and you come into the class, we need to get started, and they open the can, and the can, chuk, 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 it goes all over the place. None of that was the teachers doing, but the teachers to fix the issue. And we need to have people in these national discuss discussions, Bruce, we need people in the resource meetings talking about that can opening, and the layer upon layer upon layer upon layer that led to the can being too fizzy to be able to cope. Because we're all in here with the best of intentions, but the problem is resourcing and eyes not being in the right place. Your point about all of the A's and everybody wanting an A and everybody getting to university, very good. Where is the money in education going? It's going into the RICs, it's going into high up um, organisation that's not at grassroots that would do all the things that you want. So now I'm coming down off my soapbox and I'm happy to have a wee chat with you at the end. But here's to the teachers that we need to be able to fix this, who need to be on our side with that and we need to understand that because I don't want to be bitten when I go to my work either or spat on or whatever so thank you very much. No that was a wonderful example thank you for that. Um, would any of you like to speak on? Let's get on to question two. <laughs> All right okay. <laughs> There's a lot of sneaky, multiple layer questions in this school exclusion one. So people are getting like three questions in a, at once. So don't feel like you've got to answer all of it. Maybe it's bit, pick, pick the bit that you're interested in. Research shows that children in deprived areas are more likely to be excluded, have limited subject choice, are less likely to stay on at school post-16, with many reporting they're actively discouraged from staying on. What do you think we can do about this? How do we increase support and advocacy and how do we understand the extent of the problem? Would anyone like to start us off? Do we want to ask the, the audience in terms of what they think? Um, yeah, if anyone from the floor wants to answer. Any, oh, people, there we go. I was wondering about getting people to stand up again and think. So oh, is, yeah. How, how big a problem is this in your in your local authority, do you think? So I suppose if we're talking about um, the link, I, I, 
the big question. The link between poverty and... Hey, sorry, Bruce, but can you use the microphone? Sorry. 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 Um, so we, we're looking at the link between poverty and, and, and exclusion, I, I think, around this. But So, again, if everyone could stand up and how big... Do, so, do you think in your local authority that this is a, a kind of huge issue or actually it's not so much of an issue or... So... Lots of high... Who's got the lowest hand in the room? Who's got the lowest hand in the room? Um, anyone? Anyone want to kind of... So nobody's doing this well. I think, I think we, we, we all acknowledge that. You're middle? Okay. Well, the, the reason I'm middling is because Perthshire is typically quite an affluent area in a lot of respects. So I think when it comes to the deprived... so I'll sit down again. When it comes to the deprived areas and subject choice, I think so a lot of people in Perth are really quite lucky um, in some regards because, you know, parents, and certainly in my own school, because it is such an affluent area, get tutors and things like that. So, I mean, a lot of these issues somehow get avoided. And obviously that, this speaks to the issue of uh, the poverty-related attainment gap and um, other issues around inequality. But I think for, for my own area, it's not a, a, as big of an issue as it could be. Um, but where I, where I grew up, so I'm not originally from Perthshire, I'm actually from Fife. Um, so where I'm originally from, I think it's a much bigger issue because there's a lot more poverty, there's a, lot, there's a greater proportion of socioeconomic issues within the community and there's a lot greater emphasis on doing things like English and maths as opposed to getting to do more things like drama and so on. And it's, it's, I think it's, yeah, obviously like I say, Perthshire is just a bit lucky in that regard. Um, but it's definitely an issue in Scotland, I'll, I'll give it that. Um, when, I, when I started this job five and a half years ago and travelled around the country and asked children and young people what the biggest issues were, poverty came through as the number one issue. And that was pre-COVID, pre the current escalation in the cost of, cost of living. So poverty's always been a, a significant human rights issue in Scotland. And we know that, that poverty directly impacts children's experience of their rights in every aspect in terms of education and socialisation, the ability to, to be involved in community, mental and physical health, um, the links to the criminal justice system as well. It was actually the topic of the National Youth Work Conference yesterday the, that I was at here, here in Glasgow and this really strong focus about the role of youth work um, alongside the education system. Um, and, I, and I think that we need to see uh, poverty as a human rights issue and we need to take a, a human rights based response to that in terms of the resourcing discussions that we're having around addressing the, the huge impact that, that poverty has and really addressing the, the root causes of poverty and recognising the obligation on the government to address that. And, and again, it's, it's been, been said many times that, that, that allowing poverty to continue is a, a political failure, it's a political choice. Um, and we really need to, to reframe the discussion around poverty as something that um, can be addressed by, by government and then linking that to, to exclusion, but it also links very, very closely to uh, poor mental health, links very, very closely to engagement in the, in the criminal justice system as well. Um, and so I think that the addressing poverty as a human rights issue is, is absolutely essential um, and that connection to, to education is really strong. Yeah, so, I mean, we all know the statistics on this. So, um, the Scottish Government guidance outlines very clearly the catastrophic detrimental effects that exclusion has on pupils. We know from our own exclusion statistics that exclusion is disproportionately uh, targeted at pupils from um, the lower SIMD uh, percentiles, um, looked after children, uh, children with additional support needs and disabilities. Um, uh, male pupils over female pupils uh, and we know from the research including um, Professor Gillian McCluskey from the University of Edinburgh that exclusion doesn't work it doesn't do any of the things that we hope it might do it doesn't improve behavior it doesn't really help relations with the school uh, and in, in many cases it actually exacerbates those problems um, so why are we still doing it uh, is, is the question there. And I think if we think back to some of the, the um, we, I think somebody said already, um, all behaviour is communication. We think actually we can see this as a kind of communication and um, that schools who are struggling with pupils, it almost becomes a kind of coded 
form of communication with head office. Uh, uh, and so rather than having a sensible conversation about resourcing and mainstreaming and appropriate placements and appropriate supports, this is what we do instead because it's the thing that is available and it's what we do when there's a serious incident rather than there being any beneficial use to it. So I think, I think actually if we could get beyond that into having the com kind of conversations that we want to have, uh, which is how can, we, how can we get this child into a place where this behavior is not happening and they're being appropriately supported and, and, and so on, that, that actually the need for exclusion then would, would, would diminish. Um, in regards to the first question, what do you think can be done about... <laughs> what I was going to say was that going to different schools, so if we could put like a scheme, for example, in place where schools collaborate, I think it kind of exists, but it's not official. So if it becomes more official where if their school has no resource to offer so-and-so hires, then we could go to so-and-so school. And then again, it could be in a small um, area where there are not many schools. It could be just that one school. So that's where, um, I don't know if people have heard of this, Ig, Ig Soil? Yeah, it's e-school basically. And it was created for the students in the high, Highlands and Islands who couldn't like come to like, you know, because of the travel and everything. So if that could be kind of extended to the schools that, you know, cannot offer the the hires and whatever, then I feel like that would be like a really great um, solution to that. And then how do we increase support and advocacy? I feel like we just need people in the higher places to see, you know, what is going on. Because I feel like when we have a lot of consultations and things, I feel like to just go to the schools that they can't see. But what about the unseen people? So if they go to the unseen people, they go to the less listened to, then I feel like it would increase support and advocacy. And lastly, I honestly don't understand the extent of the problem because I would say I'm privileged enough to have done, I think I did five hires and one advanced hire. There were like a lot of subjects on that. And when I told people I did higher sociology, advanced hire psychology, everyone's like, oh my God, your school does that. And I was like, yeah. So I was really privileged enough to do those, you know, subjects have that variety. And so I don't really know the extent, but I know it's like a problem where I can't, if for example, I want to do law, I can't, I don't have access to the subjects I want to do, I realize how much of an impact that will have on me, so, yeah. I was actually just thinking there, this is a perfect example of myself thinking as I'm speaking. Um, I'm actually gonna change my position on how big of an issue, I, or the extent of the issue I think is, because I was just thinking, you know, because Oxford Order and, you know, Perthshire and stuff typically is a bit more affluent, a lot of the issues around poverty sometimes go actually under the radar and they're not thought about. And I was also thinking about, you know, some of the five schools and all the rest of it. Um, and as you're saying, Zainab, you know, people are shocked that your school did psychology. If a school is struggling in terms of attainment and league tables and all the rest of it, and there's, you know, a greater proportion of um, social issues within the school and within the community than other areas, teachers don't go to that school. So they'll, they'll go to the better school, the better school, with the kids who are, you know, typically more affluent and typically get on much better. There's not as many, you know, um, problems with kids who are in distress and so on. Um, so what I think happens is, it come, again, comes back to resourcing. Schools with um, greater socioeconomic difficulties within their communities don't get the teachers that do psychology, that do sociology. And this again exacerbates this income disparity and the grades, um, sorry, what's the word again? Income, poverty related attainment gap. That's the one, poverty related attainment gap, thank you. Um, I, I think that exacerbates the issue and it's this kind of poverty going underneath the radar in my area and teachers and people picking schools based on league tables and then that again, creating this negative feedback loop whereby, you know, teachers leave the school because they're not doing as well as in attainment and then, you know, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and then we actually need to try and break these cycles, um, which is just, again, my, my thinking as I, as I go along. Um, would anybody else like to? Any more from the audience? Yeah. This lady's been coming too. Right. Okay. 
Um, just, just to say that I think a big part of the discussion that we always leave out is how schools are part of structural inequality. And schools reinforce structural inequalities. And so I'm a bit concerned sometimes that, that, um, that then sometimes even the word poverty, the word poverty sort of um, gets away from the discussion about class, um, the discussion about racism, gender, fluidity, you know, uh, stereotypes of gender, also how the curriculum reinforces inequality, both by content as well as pedagogy, how, how you know, classes are taught in schools. And so then um, I think personally, I think that um, some of the students know this. When they're in school, they know what's happening. And then, you know, that could be interpreted as anger. That could be interpreted as there's no any, any space for their voice or for their reality, what they see in the world, and the opportunities that could be created for them to analyse that and to have an advocacy academy in schools. That's what should be happening. And so, I know the discussion about dysfunctional families. I mean, there's real challenges for families, for kids in the schools that um, need to be part of the curriculum. These are opportunities, they're no, they're no problems. So I think we're missing a bit. And then also the piece about statistics and data. The data show that exclusions is a bigger issue in, in lower income communities and within communities in those communities. So that's what we should be looking at. Why is this happening? That not just the symptoms, but why? And then until we look at why, we're not really got to get the solution. Whether it be in policy, whether it be in resources, whether it be in teacher training, whether it be in the school administration, whether it be in government, who's in government and the decisions that they're making, and why resources, why working class kids are getting working class jobs. Um, and anyway, the subject areas that the choices are, you've talked about, we know these things, but what we done about it? So I'll leave it there. Hiya. So I, w I had a thought of what I was going to say, and my including colleague next to me whispered to me exactly what I was going to say. So it's obviously <laughs> something that we've, we've noticed. Um, that there's exclusion, but there's also a different kind of exclusion that manifests as truancy, where young people will exclude themselves um, because school's not working for them. For a brief period of time, Includem worked with, I think it's Pupil Equity Fund money from schools, and we were able to go into schools, get a list of names of people that weren't attending or were struggling, and we could go to their house. And I want to use this one example of a boy it was a really quick intervention. Um, all I knew about him was he had bright red hair and he wasn't coming to school. So I knew his address. The letterbox was taped up. So I sat outside his house. Um, a, couple, you know, a bit of time each day, until eventually I saw a woman with bright red hair, with a baby with bright red hair. I thought, right, that's the mom. So I went and grabbed her. The, I found out that the door was taped up so that they weren't getting any bills because they couldn't afford anything. Um, she didn't know her son wasn't going to school because he'd blocked the school's number, which I think is really clever. Um, but he, talking to him, the family was in poverty. He wasn't going to school because his school uniform didn't fit and he had holes in his shoes. So once that was sorted, he was back at school, fine, no problem, that was it done. No social work intervention, nothing. Really quick, really easy solution. So the extent of the problem is huge. I've worked across Fife, um, Sterling, Falkirk, Glasgow, West, East, Western Berkshire, poverty is huge. Um, in and out of people's houses, you get referrals for all sorts of different emotional distress. It's all linked to poverty. Um, and not just poverty, money-wise, poverty of opportunity, po you know, poverty of community poverty. Um, and in terms of what can be done about it, it's resourcing again. Um, you know, give me enough to pay my bills and food and I'll go and do it, I'll chase people. You know, there are people that will go and do it, there are organisations that will go and do it, there just needs to be the resources and the motivation to do it, because the teachers can't go out of school and chase people up. You know? uh, they don't ha often have the information about what's going on at home, they just see the, the, the coat can opening up, whoever said that. But they, you know, it needs to be addressed at home, at night, in the mornings, before and after school, all those times when things are going wrong, when people are feeling the effects of poverty. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a really, <coughs> really nice example of, of uh, sometimes it's a really specific thing that that just it can be fixed actually quite easily, uh, and and the, the sort of blockage is there. I think you know uh, non attendance at school and exclusions from school is, is is a problem because by and large schools are really beneficial places for, for kids to be, um, and and there's a lot of unsung work. I don't think there's much evidence of teachers choosing schools based on attainment. I know that a lot of parents do that. I think there's a lot of exceptional teachers that, that seek out these jobs in, in challenging areas and, and do a lot of kind of unsung work in terms of cost of living, cost of school day, that happens at schools in, in these kind of areas. And um, we need to recognize that that's, that's a really important um, support service for, for kids. And it's why, one of the reasons why exclusion can be so damaging, because actually you're not just out of education, but you might be out of your free school meals for, for that period of time. Uh, you might be out of the only adult who takes an interest in, in uh, you know, how, how your day's going and how you're feeling. And there's, there's a lot of things that are, are sort of peripheral to education that go on in schools that are really important for kids and, and that when they're not attending, um, whether through, uh, through choice uh, in that sense or through exclusion, those things come away and, and the whole thing starts to crumble. Yeah, I just on the on that, and we did a massive project on COVID and children in COVID, and one of the globally, and one of the questions we asked them was, what was the best thing during COVID and coronavirus? And so many of the responses were from young people who were glad to be out of school, and I want you to be you know, on why they were glad to be out of school, and a lot of it was about bullying. Maybe they were trans, maybe there was something else going on. Maybe they were neurodiverse and it, and it was the breather of not having to do it. And I find, haven't really done the data properly, but it was one of the most interesting parts of the data for me because all that data was a failure of education. These young people were better off in spite of all the things that you said that are absolutely true for most young people. For these young people, it was better not to be in school and we're not really addressing that, I think, either. Just quickly. The statistic that always comes to my mind is the fact, you know, we've been doing higher since 1888. It's a very long time, and they've changed very little since. And <laughs> I know, crazy. Um, and I think the other one that comes to my head is that, um, I can't remember who said it to me, but it was roughly, you know, the school system only caters to roughly about 10% of students who fit the specific mold. And a lot of time, schools trying to fit, you know, push square blocks into circle holes, you know, those, those nursery games, that's, that's the analogy I always remember. Um, schools trying to force people into this mold doesn't work. And then for some students, you know, schools are saving grace, it works, you know, well for them. For others, it's the worst place on earth. Um, and again, this goes back to resourcing and how do we cater for different people's needs and how do we recognize different people's needs? Um, you know, just again, some of my thoughts, you know. Uh, Bruce. Yeah, just, just pick, picking up on, on that point, and, and again, within, within Scotland, we did an independent children's rights impact assessment in relation to, to um, the effects of the pandemic, and we've been doing a lot of work, work since, and the point that, that Laura was just making, I think, is really important, is that for some children, the educational experience during COVID was actually really positive, the, the flexibility they had, the, and I think, again, particularly for, for, some, for some neurodivergent children, um, actually, the, the, the educational experience was really positive, so how do we... How do we learn from that and ensure that that flexibility is maintained, um, that they're given kind of all of that support? Because one of the things that happened is that suddenly we transitioned straight back into education as it was, and we lost all of that, that good learning for, for those, those young people that were really thriving um, and really loving that, the kind of flexibility. Also conversations, particularly with, with older children that I had, were saying, I actually love the idea I can sleep in for a wee bit and kind of, I actually like doing my schoolwork late at night because that's, that's when I'm kind of engaging and, 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 and actually the school doesn't, doesn't work very well for me. And I don't think we've, we've taken enough learning from that. And so some of, the, some of the children who exclude themselves or are excluded from children, the flexibility that we had during COVID actually really worked for them so how can how can we learn from that um, and then coming back I think to the point about um, how to ensure that families are supported and linking back to to poverty again seeing this as a rights issue that 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 children have the rights to an adequate standard of living they have to, the right to support for their families and to social security support have we got a backing soundtrack now it's good. Um, um, I was going to have to go on, go on some kind of monologue or something. Um, but uh, the, the, the right to social security, the right to support for parents, parental mental health is a huge, huge, big thing. And I've spoken to a lot of, I've had teachers all around the country, particularly, I've got to say, in um, rural and island communities, where they were using pupil equity fund for exactly that purpose. 
and it was providing a, an absolute lifeline because effectively it was going and supporting families to make sure that they, they had the support that they needed, that they were entitled to, that other parts of the system were failing on, to just be able to kind of get up in the morning and make sure that you're clean and that the, the clothes were washed and, and that children could go to school and engage with the positives of schooling, which may include breakfast club and dinner clubs, and, um, but also but not having that clean uniform not being able to get to school because you, because your your parents haven't haven't woken up in the morning and, and you're a young carer, um, if you're, you're care experienced again through through the, the, the care of you all of that stuff going on, um, we know the children who are most likely to have their, their rights at risk and aren't engaging, and we know actually what really works is that kind of trusted adult kind of support, getting in and around the family, and delivering that through through schools or wherever doesn't really matter, but it needs to be someone that, that's kind of independent enough from statutory services, but funded by the state, to ensure that the family's getting that support so that the, the school can become that amazing kind of safe, supported place where you're accessing those universal services without stigma. Um, but there's a real gap because of failures in social security and kind of social work support and care provision, mental health services for parents, um, which are meaning that, that children are then missing out from school which actually for many of them would be a, a really safe space. And I'm worried that there's strong evidence that, that schools were using that PEF funding, that people equity funding, which was short-term funding and, and now doesn't exist in many places, um, to fill a gap that should be seen as a basic right um, that your family should be supported, and your, your parents' mental health should be supported, you've got social security in place so, so that you're able to, to access school in a fair way. And I think that there's a, that real gap um, I think particularly post-COVID that I'm, I'm hugely concerned about because it was fantastic work and the example you gave was amazing and I've heard that across the country, but it was often unsustainably funded and kind of done based on the, the goodwill of individual amazing practitioners, but it wasn't built in as a, a kind of core service and that, that's a huge problem. So I'm just going to interrupt before I like get to you, is that it's now quarter to six. I know that Laura has to leave kind of like quite shortly. Um, so um, I'm going to suggest that we maybe listen to your point um, and then we might kind of like, I don't know, we could try and have a look at the next question and see whether we could kind of get through one more. But yeah, I'm just conscious Laura's got to leave to catch a flight. So um, yeah, this has been wonderful. So, but let me pass the mic over to you. Thank you. I'd just like to echo what you're saying, Bruce, that the thing is whole family support really does make a difference. And certainly with the projects that I manage, they all offer whole family support, mediation and conflict resolution skills. But there's a load of organisations, many of which will be here today, that already operate in that, in the third sector, as you call us. Um, and these are really high quality interventions that really work that could demonstrate that actually having that support attached to schools would like de-distress the teachers because they would know that they could go into their local communities as community-based support. It's gone back to old-fashioned looking after your community and things like that. So I suppose when people, young people are in, in the parliamentary positions and they think about funding opportunities that come forward for um, um, charities, because we all rely on these funds, is that whole family support makes an absolute difference. And people seeing families as being problematic and no getting up for their kids and things like that, there's clearly something wrong. And again, that's distress and it's poverty and we can address things as a, a combined and all our efforts, I think, and we should have more of that, proving our partnership, saying that we do work in partnership with schools, with social work, and so not looking at it as a blame culture. Then I blame one social worker, one teacher, one this. It's a systematic failure. Um, all right, I'll shut up now. So what I'm going to suggest is that we carry on and we can squidge Laura out and Meg's going to help you get a taxi. So, um, yeah. No, you can, well, it's up to you. It's like how, how you feel. Do you want me to give you a kind of like nod when it's like in 10 oh, minutes? I'll watch Ben's watch. <laughs> okay, so can the panel uh, speak to the situation in Scotland for minority ethnic groups and other protected characteristics? Are we seeing the same patterns as in England with disproportional um, exclusion rates? Does anyone want to start off? Well, I could say something about the, the, the data. The, in the Excluded Lives Project, we have the... Um, we have been watching all of the four different jurisdictions 
And at one point, I kind of lost my head and screamed at the English people, this is an English problem, <laughs> because England is horrendous. You know, Scotland's, you know, clearly it's not good, but England is horrendous. And, and I think, you know, that the level of ex actual exclusion recorded as well as, and there's something going on in there. They're trying to learn from Scotland. Scotland's looked at as the best place to be. And in, and in many ways, it's, not, it's clear there are major problems here, you know, clear, this conversation. But you're doing better than most other places, even though it's still not good enough. And that's all I want to say. So uh, the Scottish Government collects statistics uh, every other year on exclusions and um, there's n not, a, to my knowledge, any um, particular, uh, it obviously is recorded uh, by way of a minority ethnic group um, through CMIS, but it, that's not something that's ever been sort of raised as a particular issue. In terms of protected characteristics, it's disability. Uh, and it's sex, so uh, boys are excluded much more than girls, and everybody kind of just says, oh, well, of course. Um, but, I, you know, I think there's a question there as to why that might be. Um, uh, I don't know what the answer to that question is. But, I, um, you know, so those are the two um, protected characteristics that are particularly highlighted year on year. It's black boys, as you can imagine, in England, yeah. Yeah, and, and on the on the on the disabled uh, children point, I think that that's really clear. And again, Ian led the statistics, but I think it's four times or five times more likely. Um, and again, particularly when we when we think about neurodivergent children as well, and interpreting their communication in, in, in a way that the way that's not not appropriate. And one of the things that I'm I'm really concerned about is that we've actually got some legal structures in place, like coordinated support plans, that that many of these children, particularly care experienced children, um, are entitled to, which would give kind of legal protection in terms of the kind of education plan um, that you could then take to the additional support needs tribunal. Again, Ian's the, the expert on on this, but there's actually kind of a domestic legal framework that would that should be providing protection for many of these children and it's not being used and I think there's a very strong um, concern that we've got that it's intentionally not being used because it's got accountability and I think the big message for me is there's a real lack of accountability. We've all recognised what the problems are um, and, and we, we see that every day in the children and young people we, we speak to but there's a real lack of mechanisms for access to justice and accountability on this. So, uh, sorry to hog this, but this is kind of my, my thing. Um, so, um, one of the interesting conversations we've been having recently is that um, in terms of the law, when a child is excluded from school, the local authority have to tell them about their right of appeal. So, the school will say, you've been excluded from school three days, uh, you've got a right of appeal, you can go to the Education Appeal Committee. And that's fine, but there's no duty to tell um, the child or, or their parents about the rights that they have in terms of bringing a case to the tribunal where the exclusion um, is related to the child's disability. Um, and so that is a conversation that we've been having recently with the tribunal uh, and actually with some of the local authorities around that. So uh, there's at least one local authority who are going back and looking at their standard letters on that. And actually the tribunal, um, if you go and look at the cases, there's a really, a really good legal framework in which to look at these things because you can look at the individual case uh, and about whether there was discrimination there, but also particularly for local authority schools um, about this, this idea of uh, indirect discrimination. So some of the questions that we're asking there is, well, let's look at the rates of exclusion within this local authority for uh, people who are not disabled compared with people who are disabled, people who have specifically ADHD, if that's the issue, or specifically uh, on the autistic spectrum, uh, where that's the issue, and, and where is your justification for that? So it really puts the ball back in the authorities' court in terms of saying, you know, why is that the case? Is that something that you can justify? And where that's not the case, the tribunal's remedies are much broader. If you go to an appeal at the Education Appeal Committee, you win your appeal, the exclusion comes off your record, that's it, it's an individual effect. You go to the tribunal, the tribunal has got much broader powers and can say to the local authority, you need to change your policy on this. You need to consult meaningfully with young people who have been excluded in doing so. Uh, you need to put in place targets for reducing that exclusion gap between uh, disabled pupils and, and non-disabled pupils. So it's, it's, it's a really... Um, beneficial, I think, favourable legal framework in which to, to ask those questions and, and to have them answered. That's actually really interesting. Sorry, Zainab, but you wanted to... No, you go um, I was going to say, um, would you think there's a reluctance to provide these sorts of uh, legally binding care plans? Because obviously you mentioned about the tribunals and stuff, but would you say 
local authorities and schools are reluctant to actually provide these sort of care plans in the first place? I don't know, that's kind of my first immediate thought. I mean, there definitely is. I don't, I don't think that's so much of an issue when it comes to exclusions. Um, you know, I think that's a broader issue about um, the coordinated support plan. And what we've seen in recent years is there's been a, a big increase in the number of pupils recorded as having additional support needs and a corresponding decrease in the number of pupils with coordinated support plans. So something isn't adding up there. And I think it, it, is, it would be fair to describe that as a reluctance to open those plans. Yeah, that's part of it, at least. Just want to say thank you to Laura as she leaves. Uh, what I was going to say in regards to the question is I don't think it's, it's as bad as England. However, in regards to the exclusion rates, most of them are informal. Like, most of them don't go through the books. And when I think about ex exclusion, I don't, I'm not really just thinking about the ones where it's just like, you're excluded, don't come to school ever again. I'm thinking about the ones where they're like, we don't want you in the school premises right now, leave. We don't want to see you for two days, and then you can come back. You see, those two days you've missed, and you keep missing those days, it's not like you're not coming back to school again, but they keep taking you out of school. I feel like you get excluded from, you know, from your things. So I feel like in regards to that, then, yeah. Because literally, when I was coming here, when I was coming here, um, I got for a, a phone call from my brother's um, school. Is that the parent of so and so? And she's like, "Well, I need you to come remove him from school premises." And then she's like, "Oh yeah, he's been really disorderly, blah blah blah." And I'm explaining to her, my mom is not home. I'm not home, so he can't come. And she's like, "I don't know what's going to happen, but he needs to get off school, you know." property and I'm like where's he gonna go and she was like I don't know he could just sit at the bus stop so my brother went to the bus stop and my mom had to my mom came here but had to leave early to go pick him up from the bus stop so that kind of thing is not documented do you get what I mean it's not documented he's gonna go to school tomorrow but it's not documented what just happened so that's kind of my point of view Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know how the rest of you feel about this, but when you say like exclusions can sometimes be given out for really flaky or silly reasons, and like, I mean, certainly, I mean, I've seen exclusions in my own school and in other schools um, and amongst my friendship group. And sometimes, you know, you'll read the letter you get from local authority for the reason why you've been excluded, and you think, really, you're excluding someone for that? Um, and you know, it's, it comes back to the question. Did the school create the situation that caused the exclusion in the first place? Would you, would you say that's an issue at all? I don't know, yeah? I mean, I think probably not deliberately, um, but uh, I mean, certainly, you know, there's some kind of wider structural issues that, that contribute to, to behaviours and so on. Um, I can only speak to the cases that come to me, they tend to be fairly serious incidents um, and there's you know there's question marks about how they how they dealt with um, but yeah there, there may well be a um, uh, thing with I guess a, a short-term exclusion um, that is a, a one-off or, or an occasional thing is that you know you're back in school in a very short period of time who's who's got the time and energy and inclination to appeal that just for the sake of taking it off your school record so uh, you know the, the the rates of appeal are actually fairly low even though individual pupils may feel aggrieved at, at um, the, the individual case. So again, there's not necessarily a record of all of that. And, and just one more point linked to protected characteristics in terms of disabled children in Scotland. One of the things that we saw throughout the pandemic was, was an increase in kind of moves to, to home edu education where, where schools were failing to provide the, um, the tailored support and reasonable adjustments that you would expect to ensure that, that disabled children could continue to engage with education. That wasn't working for many disabled children. And, and so we have seen an increase in, in children coming outside of, of the, the education system and school-based mainstream kind of school-based education system or even, even kind of the specialised provision um, towards homeschooling. And I don't think there's been enough work around that in terms of a lot of the, the parents that we speak to are saying it wasn't a choice. That, that it's not that they have a, a kind of a, a preference for homeschooling. It was just that they weren't receiving the support from the state that, that they should have got. That holistic approach to an education that develops children to their fullest potential um, wasn't available, and, and so they're defaulting into homeschooling. And, and I am concerned that, that that we're seeing kind of more of that in, in terms of it wouldn't be labelled as, as exclusion um, because it's seen as, as, as a voluntary choice, but actually it's, it's a choice pre predicated. It's, it's a choice that 
um, where parents are saying we, we don't really have a choice here, we, we, we're doing it because there is no, no real provision. And, and I think that there's, there's a piece of work that needs to be done uh, around that as well. So I'm going to just interrupt. We're a little bit over time and we have the wine coming in. So um, I would like to um, maybe ask the panel if they've got just to kind of like, if they've got anything else they would like to sort of like sum up or if there's something they haven't managed to kind of like say, um, just to sort of like round off. And then we can finish for the day and have a little bit of a break, have some wine, carry on the chat that we had during the cups of tea for those that can stay. And then we're going to screen um, the documentary. So... And just one final thing I wanted to say was that regardless of all these issues, I feel like it just goes back to the conversations with the people being affected. So I feel like there's a lot of barriers with the people making you know, the processes, the system, and the people who are actually affected by these decisions. So any decision made for us without us is against us, and that's just a simple thing. So if you're not coming to us to talk to us about how this is going to affect us, then it's against us. I don't care what you think your intention is about, but if you're not talking to us about it, it's against us. Um, I just want to say thanks to, to everyone that's been been involved in this. I know it's been a, a huge labour of love, and I, I know it's been incredibly challenging, and, and it, it's been really exciting to be part of this. Um, so thanks to, to all of you who have been real leaders in this, and human rights leaders, which is absolutely fantastic. And, and again, for all of the, the, the young human rights defenders that are here, huge, huge thank you. And, and also to, to all of you in, in the room, uh, I think it's been a really powerful discussion. And I think that what's really important to me is that, is that we take what we've discussed and learned here and think about how we can use any of the kind of power that we have to affect change. And so my kind of big request then would be, please get in contact with me and, and my office and um, talk about how we can support you to, to affect change for, for children and young people, because I would like this to be part of a, an ongoing conversation. So just a, a big thanks. And also just reflecting on um, the huge work that's been done over the last few years during the, the pandemic. Um, I, I know that, that, that all of you in the room have, have been working incredibly hard and I know that kind of feeling that we're, we're all tired at the moment and when you're confronted with all of the challenges we've, we've seen here. But, um, so just a, a big thank you and a big commitment from me to, to support you in any way that I can. Yeah, um, just to reiterate the previous points as well, thank you so much. I mean, although we're talking about some really difficult subjects um, and there's a lot of issues within education within Scotland at the moment, the fact that you're all here sitting in this room goes to show that people are caring, people do want to make a change, and that, you know, the fact that we have our MSYPs and other young people in the room, and we've got, you know, people from all different sectors across our country, this does actually show me that there is hope. You know, there are people who want to listen, there are people who want to make a change, so for that and all the work that you guys have been doing, thank you so much. So one point that I did want to make that I thought might come up in a, a later question that we didn't get to was, was one of the depressing things about uh, informal exclusions and part-time timetabling and all of those uh, other things that, that don't necessarily come under the heading of exclusion in terms of how they're described is not that it's legally complex to deal with, it's, it's that it's actually legally very straightforward to deal with. You're entitled to a full-time school education, and if that's not happening, then we can make that happen really quickly. And so it shouldn't take somebody coming to a lawyer um, to do that. And so I think that there's just a big issue around children and, and families being aware of, of their rights uh, and, um, and then being empowered to, to insist on them. And I just want to really echo what uh, Bruce has said. Like this, this whole event was put together to start conversations, to connect people up from the human rights sector, from the education sector, from like you know the legal sector. Like, and we kind of like are at an overlap. Our, my organisation and I wanted to kind of like bring that together. Looks like it's happened. You know, it's worked. We've got some really different people in this room um, chatting at lunchtime. Please continue to chat now, but let's take the conversation on afterwards. This is one moment in the life of the excluded documentary. I want it to continue. So um, let, I hope that we get to do that. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you.